the results of the analysis, economic analysis of adaptation options, which is uh, which was conducted during the second year of our three-year project. So just to give you a uh, this is already mentioned by Professor Mendoza earlier, but just to recap, um, this album is actually part of the three-year study developing capacity to adapt to climate change. Um, and for the second year, what we actually did was using our insights and results from year one project to identify possible adaptation options, which we which we actually uh, subjected to economic analysis. And the focus is on the problem of flooding, uh, valuing its impact, identifying the adaptation options that could minimize these impacts. The study site is now more narrowed down. Uh, from the 12 municipalities, we focus on three municipalities belonging in the Santa Cruz River watershed. Um, and this covers the municipalities of Santa Cruz, Victoria, Pila, and parts of Pagsanhan and Kalawan. Um, also, part of my presentation is highlighting the usefulness of economic analysis as a tool for assisting local government units in decision making. Okay? So, uh, this was already presented also earlier. So, just to highlight, this is the result of the second year, which is economic analysis of adaptation options. So, first question, why do we focus on floods? Why did we choose floods as our hazard that uh, needs to be addressed? Um, first, typhoons and floods, as we know, will become more and more intense, if not more frequent, in the coming years because of climate change and also because of anthropogenic activities. Okay? Um, vulnerability analysis from our year one project showed that floods and typhoons have the widest impact in terms of the number of houses exposed to the hazard. So as you can see in our um, figure below, about 57% of the respondents in that particular study site uh, are exposed to flooding and typhoons. Only 49% uh, are exposed to drought and 4% are exposed to landslides. So that is the reason why we focus on flooding as our main hazard focus. Also, during our survey, we found out that there is a presence of long-term flooding along the nature municipalities of Santa Cruz. That's a for us to as four months even. So that is a very crucial um, uh, problem that we need to address in this case. So to give you a visual representation, this was a uh, photo taken by the Santa Cruz local government. So this was during the typhoon Katsana or typhoon Nundoy. So as you can see here, very, very massive devastation. Uh, the upper part is their lagoon, uh, that is their municipal uh, hall, and then provincial hall, sorry, and then the church. Uh, this one is the school in Santo Angel, elementary school in Santo Angel, and this one is the, the other side is the business district of Santa Cruz. Uh, they experienced long term flooding of as long as four months. So, this is an aerial photograph of the uh, extent of flooding during those uh, during the typhoon Ketsana. So as you can see, type flooding is really an important issue to be addressed. Second, why focus on the Santa Cruz River watershed? Um, during our first year vulnerability analysis, we found that the top three most vulnerable barangays in the study site are situated along the Santa Cruz River watershed. So that is the primary reason why we selected that site. Second, it is where the highest peak run of was estimated. So we uh, ran on another set of analysis, estimating the, actually simulating the possible flooding in the future. And we found out that the peak run of was highest for the Santa Cruz River watershed. So before, this was, uh, during the first year of our project, this was our study site. In the second year, we narrowed down focusing only on the nature municipalities of Santa Cruz River watershed. So it covers Santa Cruz, Pila, Victoria, parts of Pagsanan, and Kalawan. So what is adaptation? So our study is all about analyzing adaptation. Adaptation is any modification in the behavior of households or any intervention that are meant to reduce the impacts of the hazards, climate-related hazards. So in our case, uh, flooding hazard. Um, and there is uh, there are two types basically of adaptation, autonomous adaptation and plant adaptation. Autonomous adaptation are adaptation activities um, independently undertaken by households. So there's 
ensure that all stakeholders are involved in the decision making. One is to make it socially acceptable, and second, to make it technically feasible as well. So we involve not only the local government, but the policy makers, but we also involve technical experts coming from that end. Um, as you can see, our process is very long and arduous. As you can see, we have conducted a series of consultations with different stakeholders to arrive at our finalist of adaptation options for economic analysis. Um, and this was uh, our, uh, this was this were our identified options. First is the early warning system. So the early warning system is plan to be implemented along all the nature municipalities in the Santa Cruz River watershed. Um, the second uh, option is focusing on the areas or lakeshore barangays in the Santa Cruz River watershed that experiences uh, long-term inundation. Uh, and what we identified are one evacuation, construction of an evacuation center, Second is relocation op option, and the third is building modification. So essentially, we have several sub-studies sub within the project. Um, for the analytical method, for the early warning system, um, the analysis that we use is what we call benefit cost analysis. Well, for the specialty study for adaptation to long-term floods, we made use of cost-effectiveness analysis. Um, this is also a risk-based cost-effectiveness analysis. So we had three sub-studies. First is uh, projecting flood inundation maps and estimating damage costs. And the second sub-study is the BC of early warning system. And the last study is the cost-effectiveness analysis of uh, relocation, evacuation, and building modification. Um, as you can see here also, the results of study 1 was used as an input for study 3. So why do we need to conduct economic analysis? So there, as we know, the root problem for economics is because of scarcity. Okay? We have limited resources. We have many projects, even good ones, that can eat for very, very valuable yet very scarce um, supply. So there is a need for a tool by which we can help local government units in making decisions on where to invest, which projects to implement. So economic analysis is a framework that can be used for such a purpose. Um, the advantage basically of using economic analysis is that first, it is a systematic way of decision making. If it is systematic, it follows a rigorous step rigorous methodology. Second, it is transparent. Okay? Uh, transparency meaning we know who are affected and what is the extent of the impact of a certain project. Third, it is relatively simple decision making because we're just comparing one single uh, measurable unit. So, and then last, it is, uh, it uses an acceptable criteria which is efficiency. So, how do we make decisions using economics? A project is good if it can improve the society's welfare. So a key word is social welfare, societal welfare. That is when the aggregate benefit exceeds the aggregate cost of the project. And it is simple because we can easily compare different projects even having different impacts or outcomes because we convert those impacts or outcomes into a single numerator, which is usually in terms of money. Okay? And that is relatively easy to compare. And as we know, money is very universal. We know what one person means, we know what one dollar means. So it's not difficult to communicate with local government units or even uh, normal uh, households or no, normal individuals. It's it's not very difficult to communicate in terms of money. Um, I would also like to emphasize that economic analysis is different from financial analysis, where in financial analysis is just interested with private profitability, while economic analysis is looking at the society as a whole. It is also different. 
effectiveness analysis. Um, with PCA, we use the concept of the net present value in deciding whether the project is good or not. So, net present value is simply the present value of benefits minus the present value of costs. Um, both benefits and measures and costs are measured in monetary terms. And we consider a project as good if the NPV is positive or greater than zero. Cost effectiveness, on the other hand, cost effectiveness analysis helps identify the least costly option that can attain a specified objective based on the cost effectiveness ratio. In this case, only the cost is measured in monetary terms, while the benefit is measured in some other uh, unit of measure. Like, for example, the number of households or total area protected. Um, in CR, in computing for CER, it is simply benefit or the effectiveness measure divided by the present value of cost. And the best project can be chosen based on the one with the lowest cost effectiveness ratio. Just to highlight uh, the summary of the methods that we use, for flood inundation maps, uh, we were able to produce those maps using the rational method and GIS modeling. Of course, this is an engineering activity, so Professor Valera was the one who uh, conducted this uh, particular part of the study. In terms of damage cost estimation, we use the data from the household survey, and what we estimated is the direct damage cost, which covers property losses and asset losses to the households. For PCA of early warning system, um, to estimate the benefit, what we used was the contingent valuation method. Um, later on, I will discuss further this approach. Um, it is a stated preference technique to elicit willingness to pay of households so that we are able to estimate the benefit of the project. Uh, for cost effectiveness analysis, uh, we used a simple Monte Carlo risk-based uh, evaluation. So why do we need to conduct a risk-based analysis? Uh, because of the fact that um, since we are projecting into the future, we know that there is many uncertainties. So we have to take into account of those uncertainties and one way that we can ensure that those uncertainties are incorporated in the analysis is by using risk-based analysis, which is Monte Carlo. So this is our uh, study site and the location of the households that we interviewed in our survey. So 500 randomly chosen households, um, just to emphasize the randomness of our uh, sampling design. For the description of the respondents, about 64% are female, 76% are married, the mean age is 48, and the mean years of schooling is 9. The average individual income is about 5,000 per month, while the mean household monthly income is 17,000 per month. The average household size is 5. In terms of livelihood, 61% are employed in the services sector. Um, 27% have their own small businesses, 7% are involved in farming, and 5% are in livestock and poultry raising. 77% of the households own their house, 91% are single detached homes, while 75% are single story houses, and only 24% have two story houses. I think this information is crucial in designing the adaptation option. Uh, since uh, we know that one of the ways by which we can minimize the impact of floods is by raising your house structure to avoid damages and property losses. And 83% have homes that are made from predominantly permanent materials. In terms of exposure, the mean frequency of floods in the last 10 years is 5. Frequency of floods that flow inside their houses is 3 in the last 10 years. And the highest flood height, the mean is 1, feet, one foot. And the longest duration in days is, the mean is 16 days. So it is uh, also interesting to look at the distribution of, this, of the exposure of households. So as we can see here, um, there are about 50% that experience less than one foot 
flood. Uh, about 15 percent, one to two feet. Three to four feet, 14 percent, and six percent are actually exposed to floods that exceed five feet. So this is an important finding, especially for me. <laughs> So, uh, and then the longest duration, um, less than one day, about 49%. But it is interesting to look at the, those that experienced floods for a month, about 5%, two months, 6%. And as you can see, um, there are reports of experiencing floods for as long as five months, which comprise 1% of the respondents. So this is the result of the flood inundation maps and our damage cost estimation. So first we look at the land risk cover for the study site. Majority uh, are rice fields, okay, and then there is a, the rice fields are the ones in yellow. Uh, the built-up or residential lands are the one in red, and then um, there are areas where in coconut trees are planted. So those are the predominant views for the uh, study site. So these now are the projected flooding in uh, for projected inundation in the study site for different uh, flood um, return periods. So we considered one in two years, one in fifteen years, one in twenty-five years, and one in fifty years. Uh, for one in two years flood, this is the most common, commonly occurring flood. This is the the blue area represents areas that are projected to be inundated. This one is one in fifteen years, one in twenty-five years, and one in fifty years. So, um, in numbers, what we can see here is that a one in two year flood can actually inundate 146.8 hectares. One in 15 year flood can inundate 309.5 hectares. One in 25 year flood can inundate 375.1 hectares. And one in 50 years, 506.4 hectares of built up or residential lands. Okay? So which municipality is affected the most? In absolute terms, we can see here that Santa Cruz it runs as, uh, has the highest um, coverage in terms of projected inundation. So Santa Cruz is the one represented by the yellow uh, color. This is followed by Victoria and then Pila and Kalawan. Uh, Pagsanhan is not reflected in this particular table because we were not able to get uh, data for their municipality. In terms of percentage coverage, although Santa Cruz has the highest inundation, inundated lands in terms of absolute uh, hectares, um, in this figure, what you can see is that Victoria um, has the highest percentage coverage of inundation. Okay, and this is followed by Santa Cruz, and Pila and lastly by Kalawan. For Victoria, as you can see, a 1 in 50 year flood can cover about 63% of all the residential or built up lands. In terms of rice lands, um, we predicted the areas that will be inundated by at least a 2.5 feet flood. Um, we can see here that a 1 in 50 year flood can inundate of more than 2,500 hectares of rice lands. Um, in absolute terms, the largest would be in Victoria and actually Santa Cruz and then followed by Victoria and Pila. But in terms of percentage coverage, the highest is in Santa Cruz, okay? uh, inundating as much as uh, 47% of their total rice lands for a 1 in 50 year flood, followed by Victoria and last by Pila. In terms of damage cost, we estimated uh, the mean, median, and mode damage cost as reported by the households uh, corresponding to different uh, flood events in 
the past three years. So, we considered Habakkuk occurred in 2012, although in 2009 and sadly 2009. Um, the mean damage cost per hectare is about 6,511 for Habakkuk, 9,000 for Oloy, and 16,900 for Sadi. Okay. We just compare that to per capita household income per month, we can see that it is even higher than that value. Estimates of direct damage cost per flood event by flood that was also estimated in the study. Um, for a flood that of 4 feet and above, that would result in a, an 8,200 peso uh, damage cost. Uh, 2.5 to 3.9 feet per thousand. 300 pesos, 2 to 2.4 feet, 1,700 pesos. Um, for rice lands, uh, we just use estimates by uh, conducted by the Department of Agriculture. We use the net profit loss as our estimate for the damage cost. And uh, for a hectare, the expected damage cost is 29,600 pesos if flood even days the rise lands by at least 2.5 feet. So what are the uses of the estimate? Um, this, this damage cost estimates can be used as an approximation of the benefit of flood control projects. For example, if there would be uh, studies that look into road like system, the road like system that would eliminate flooding in Laguna or lake dredging, then we can use this estimate. Um, in our study, we used it in the cost effectiveness analysis for relocation, evacuation, and building modification. Uh, specifically, we used the values as an estimate of the residual flood damage cost from evacuation and building modification. So now we proceed to the second sub-study, which is benefit cost analysis of a flood early warning system. Um, the flood early warning system uh, was conceptualized to use uh, technology that were developed by um, DOSTASTI. Um, specifically, the automated weather system and the water level monitoring system. Okay? Um, and it, is, it will be installed along strategic points along the Santa Cruz River uh, watershed. Um, the expected beneficiaries are the nature of municipalities. Um, based on weather and water level data collected, that would be the basis for the issuance of the warning. And it is uh, designed in such a way that the warning would be sent through a text message to households subscribed in a service. The lead time is between 2 to 4 hours, and the information that will be sent are uh, notices about areas that will be flooded and areas that need to evacuate immediately. The institution that would be responsible for the project are the local government of the said municipalities and the duration of the project is 10 years which covers the lifespan of the equipment. So we estimated the benefit of the early warning system using the contingent valuation method. Um, as I've said earlier, CVM is a stated preference valuation technique when you work in, you directly ask households or individuals regarding their maximum willingness to pay for the project. Okay? And that maximum willingness to pay is actually the benefit that they derive from the project itself. So note that this is hypothetical. Uh, no actual payment needs to be undertaken. So, um, and that there are uh, some theoretical reasons behind this, uh, but uh, just to make sure that we ensure that truthful revelation is actually, uh, or our households actually truthfully review their preferences. Uh, for private goods, it is actually easy to estimate the benefits. It is actually reflected in the price, the market price. But for public goods, um, example of which is the early warning system, it is more difficult because there exists no market for such a good or service. So what we can do is to conduct valuation techniques. Okay? And the advantage of using CVM is that it 
the use and non-use values of the good or service. So, what do we mean by non-use values? And non-use values are those related uh, with the uh, exit, just, just knowing that the service or good exists, you derive some benefit from it. So, it is not necessary that you actually make work or you actually intend to make use of the service or you utilize the good, but just knowing that it exists, you have some benefit that you derive from knowing that it exists. Okay? Um, it is also the theoretically correct measure of benefit and welfare impact, which is um, the compensating surplus. However, its disadvantage is that it is prone to biases if not properly administered. So, these are the important uh, um, parts of administration of the CDF. First, it must follow a survey protocol and in drafting the questionnaire, uh, the scenario should be explicitly stated. Um, we, might, we must make use of a elicitation method that is incentive compatible. Um, we also need to specify a good and realistic payment vehicle and then there are also other components that must be incorporated in the questionnaire to elicit truthful revelation of willingness to pay. So for the protocol, why we conducted face-to-face -face interview and we applied probabilistic random sampling. Um, focus group discussions were done prior drafting the questionnaire and enumerators were trained before sending them off to the field. Uh, the, the questionnaires are also pre-tested uh, as well as the visual aids used and then the tailored design method was adopted. Okay? For the elicitation method, we apply a single bound dichotomous choice. This is a simple yes or no question where the respondents are asked if they are willing to pay a certain predetermined amount for the project. That certain predetermined amount are called bids. So we covered 25, 50, 100, 200, and 300 pesos per month. And these bid levels were derived from the focus group discussions. For the payment vehicle, um, we used mandatory payment. Um, that means that everyone are made to pay is compulsory and not voluntary or uh, based on contributions. Um, the payment will be collected as an additional charge in the electricity bill and will be collected on a monthly basis for a period of 10 years. Um, the collection of funds will be managed by the local government and audited by a private auditing firm. Other components of the questionnaire include the provision point. So for the provision point, uh, it was explained that the project will be implemented only if more than 50% of the households vote yes for the project. Okay? Otherwise, the project will not push through. And the purpose of this provision point is to minimize strategic bias. Um, Shimka was also included in the script. Uh, respondents were reminded of their income constraint and the existence of alternative projects to the EWS. The briefing questions were also included to identify valid from invalid bonus leads. So invalid yes answers were converted to no while the bonus leads were retained in the estimation. And the reason why we uh, do this the briefing questions is to make sure that our estimates are not um, overestimated or our uh, willingness to pay values are not overestimated. For the certainty question, uh, concerned yes answers were converted to no votes. So specifically, after they were asked if they are willing to pay or not, uh, they, the households were asked whether uh, how sure are they that they will going to vote the same vote yes if a true referendum is conducted in their barangay. So, uh, it, it is actually a rating, a scale that they would choose from um, and if they uh, exceeded the threshold, then they, their votes are converted to no votes. For the analytical method, we use non-parametric and parametric estimation, uh, specifically turnable lower bound estimate, and Hadiman's binary logic model, which is an econometric approach. Um, the bids are estimated as a function of uh, the, their votes are estimated as a function of bid, income, exposure.
exposure to floods, knowledge about PWS, autonomous adaptation behavior, the sex of the respondent, education, and age, and some dummy variable for municipality. This is the result of our uh, analysis. Um, in this table, we can see the yes votes and no votes corresponding to different mid levels. Um, as we can see here, as mid level increases from 25 to 300, the, the proportion of yes votes actually decline, while the proportion of no votes increases. So, this is a very important. Uh, condition that must be satisfied because it satisfies the law of demand, which is as the price increases, quantity demanded should decline. For the reasons for yes votes, so we can see here that uh, to ensure the readiness of community, about 73%, faith in the technology, 4%, faith in the ability of the local government, 3%, Fees affordable in their area is always at least 10%. What is critical here is the reason that they just feel happy knowing that they could help others. Uh, these are considered as invalid votes and were con converted into no votes. Okay, because this might just reflect a certain benefit from, uh, they call this in economics a swarm flow effect. You just say yes because you feel that you need to impress your interviewer. Reasons for no votes. Uh, what is important are the two reasons. First, the government should pay for the project and only the rich should pay for the project. So these are also considered as protest bids because um, this signals free riding. Okay, so this, uh, there, you have the option to eliminate these values and by doing so, you actually raise your average estimate of willingness to pay. But you can also choose to retain it to make your estimate more um, lower, a little bit lower. So the mean willingness to pay estimate okay, is 128 pesos from the Turnbull, Turnbull um, estimation. And from the logistic regression, the estimate is 140 pesos. Um, the confidence interval for mean willingness to pay from the logistic regression ranges from 127 to 152. So, um, as we can see, uh, this confidence interval is consistent with the Turnbull estimate, the lower bound uh, non parametric estimate of our willingness to pay. In terms of testing the validity, uh, we just need to make sure that our results conform to economic theory. First, willingness to pay should be negatively related to the prices. And that was actually um, um, that was actually uh, true for our case. Also, willingness to pay should be positively related to income, which is also true for our analysis. Next, prediction from the regression model recently the observed responses was uh, compared and we found that about 70% are, or 69% are correctly specified. Other insights on gender, uh, we found that, that males are more willing or more likely to be willing to pay. On risk attitude, those that are already undertaking autonomous adaptation are more likely to be willing to pay. On exposure, those that are more exposed to the hazard are more likely to be willing to pay. And on knowledge about PWS or early warning system, it seems to be insignificant, as well as education seems to be insignificant based on the based from our regression analysis. So this is the benefit cost analysis. The present value of benefits at 50% discount rate is estimated to be 340 million, while the present value of cost is 10 million, which gives us a net present value of 330 million pesos, which tells us that the project is a good project. The benefit cost ratio is 33, and the internal rate of return is 3,000%. Um, our colleagues from the other countries are actually um, questioning the high benefit cost ratio that we estimated. 
So, we looked at similar studies in other countries and we found out that it is actually a conservative estimate. In fact, the Bangladesh uh, flood case study showed a BCR of 558. A Thailand study showed a BCR of 176. Um, and the last sub-study, which is this based cost effectiveness analysis, um, just to give a background on why we did a separate sub-study, um, I've said this earlier, it is because we found the presence of long-term inundation along the Santa Cruz River uh, watershed, specifically along the lake shore, barangays of Santa Cruz. And in the recent flood event, about 8,917 houses were flooded. Okay? Inundation lasted for as long as four or even five months. And there have been historical accounts of long-term cuts in 1972, 2009, and the most recent is 2012. At present, the local government is already considering the construction of an evacuation center. But uh, our study uh, proposed alternatives to the evacuation center, specifically permanent relocation and building modification. So, with relocation, um, the communities that are exposed to this long-term flooding are, will be permanently relocated to other sites. For building modification, um, instead of relocating, uh, they will be given funding so that they can use the money to construct a higher or elevated houses. So the policy objective is to provide poor flood victims in Santa Cruz Laguna with a dignified temporary or permanent shelter so that they will be able to avoid hazards brought about by floods. And all options were designed so that they cater to 2,100 households or families. And this is our effectiveness measure. And there are advantages and disadvantages that need to be uh, put forward. Uh, aside from our numerical analysis or quantitative analysis, relocation has an advantage that it ensures the highest of probability of zero casualties during disasters. Because you are actually um, moving your communities away from the hazard prone areas. However, the disadvantages are the following it is difficult to convince people to relocate. So, second, it has the highest capital outlay. And third, it requires major and permanent adjustments for affected households. They have to find new schools, they have to find new jobs if they think that their jobs are very far from their new uh, residences or their new community. For evacuation center, its advantage is that it is flexible. Even if the flood does not occur, the building can still be used for other purposes. However, the disadvantages are as follows. It it, there are inconveniences and discomforts associated with living with other people in a public environment. There are even reports of harassment. And sometimes, or most of the time, the public schools are the chosen evacuation sites. So it actually displaces the students. So, and then also, it may not ensure zero casualties during class, especially if evacuation is untimely. For building modification, the advantage is that there is no need to uproot people from their existing community, but there are also numerous disadvantages. One of which is that the households are not shielded from other hazards like earthquake induced liquefaction. Um, it also may not ensure zero casualties during floods. And there is a, the tendency, or there is a probability that there is a need to evacuate people if floods are more intense than expected and may promote risky behavior associated with moral hazard. That is, there is an incentive for households to locate in risky areas just because they expect some cash benefit from doing so. So this is the result of our cost effectiveness ratio and what we can see here is that evacuation, building modification rather, has the lowest CER ratio, followed by evacuation and relocation. So this is the mean CER from the Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, to get a visual uh, uh, look at the risk-based cost effectiveness analysis, what this actually shows us is that 
consistently, ang evaluation has a lower CTR than the relocation option because it is located at to the left. The evaluation, the red line is located consistently to the left of the relocation option. But building modification is much more cost effective than evacuation because the red line, again, building modification, a simulated CER is consistently to the left of evacuation. Um, for the limitations, CA considered only the direct cost associated with the intervention. So we were not able to capture the psychological impacts or costs brought about by the, alter, uh, the adaptation options. Also, a simple Monte Carlo analysis was undertaken and we assumed normal distribution. And, building and the main conclusion is that building modification consistently results in a lower cost effectiveness ratio. So, just to highlight everything that I've said, um, the main conclusion is first, a uh, technology based flood early warning system is economically visible for the study site. Also, if you are to compare the three adaptation options, building modification seems to be the most cost effective. Thank you. At this point, we now open the floor for your comments or questions regarding the two presentations. Before posing your question or comment, kindly state your name and Thank you. Uh, just also one question for Tim. 
the way I see it, relocation and evacuation center as options are not really mutually exclusive. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but before you relocate, you really have to uh, evacuate. Um, are you actually thinking that these two can actually be considered as not related? In the way that we design in the analysis that they're mutually exclusive, either they either we set up an evacuation center so that only temporary um, sort of relocation will be undertaken during class, and the other one is permanent relocation within uh, that relocation center would be away from the hazards, no flooding, so it was mutually exclusive in that sense. And, and uh, an additional from uh, perhaps later on the health risk uh, related to um, resorting to relocation centers can also be included in the, in the assessment of the economic costs. Other comments or questions? from Sesam. I actually have a number of questions. Um, I would actually like to ask Ma'am and later na lang, because I didn't get to watch the entire proposal, but uh, your presentation, but um, uh, I, I would like to explore yung, um, on science communication. As an, uh, how, how are we now? Where are we now in terms of science communication? Specific, specifically with our local government partners. Pero since I didn't get to watch the entire thing, pagkakonsult na lang po ako sa inyo later. <laughs> Unless you'd like to answer. Tapos for, uh, from um, um, Kim, uh, I have several things. Uh, one is uh, in terms of building modifications, was it actually did you actually consider in your study the economic losses to the local community versus um, building modification and relocating communities? Because if you move out people, if you move them to another place, you actually deplete the economic um, potential of that area. So that versus the cost of building modification. Actually, it was not covered in the analysis. It was one of the big limitations because the uh, social, cultural, were not considered, only the direct uh, costs were considered in the analysis. So it is really a preliminary, somewhat exploratory analysis of the And um, uh, uh, the EWS, the consideration of the EWS, was it just, just to look at the willingness of communities to, 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 to become more disaster resilient, or uh, this this really look into the, the purpose is to really look into the feasibility of putting up an EWS because from my perspective, an EWS along a nature system is not it is very expensive, but it's not as necessary as an EWS along river systems. So for nature communities, the flooding, the, the rate with which floods rise is actually a lot slower than along river systems. So in some situations it's actually better for flood risk maps to be made available and people to know, just to know the rain rates and to get public announcements rather than to install expensive devices. Um, um, two things. First, um, the, the reason why we identified early warning system, it was a result of a very long consultation with communities uh, and uh, technical experts as well. So, with regard to technical and social visibility, I think we covered that area. Um, the value that I estimated in the analysis actually reflects the valuation for the early warning system. Because in CBM, uh, what they are actually valuing is the good or service that they are actually um, used in the scenario of your analysis. So it is it, it, what we value really is the benefit of the early warning system. Not just uh, uh, the benefit of risk uh, avoidance, 
it might cover that, but other factors as well might be covered. Like for example, um, just knowing that an early warning system exists might have a potential benefit for households because they feel, feel more secure. So I guess it also gives them a negative sense of um, security. The same way that it rice was, yeah, yeah. community senses of negative security, false sense of security. Um, last, and this is out of curiosity, um, you, sh you said that men were more willing to pay, and does this have to do with the fact that most of the subjects, yes. the men interviewed, are the actually the burners for the families, or are men just more I didn't actually go into that level of analysis. This was just the result of the regression, and we found, we found that uh, gender is a significant variable, and that the higher propensity for men or likelihood for men to pay. But I think that would be a very interesting study for looking at the gender aspect.
Organizational capacity, yes, we had some uh, indicators uh, for that. But uh, in terms of participation of women in decision making, uh, we were wanting. Can we give